Okay, in this video we're going to look at vectors and how they're used to solve um, simple physics problems. In actual fact, they sound complicated, but they're a really useful tool. Let me give you an example of a problem. Let's have a river, and the river is flowing at 0 0.3 meters per second. Now we have a swimmer on one side that is able to swim at 1.2 meters per second as his max speed. <laughs> and the question is, how or which direction do they need to swim in in order to make the fastest movement between the two banks and shortest time period? Now I'm sure you may have a an intuitive answer as to which you think that might be. And I'll take two of the most popular answers and see. Some of you think the best thing which we do would be to go directly across the river and therefore reduce the time period. Whereas others might think that actually going with the river means that you will um, be able to travel faster overall and therefore cover the distance. Uh, let's just take a simple direction of 45 degrees or indeed this one 45 degrees to that angle, to the to the uh, perpendicular, um, or at 90 degrees to the bank. We'll call this one uh, solution one. This one we'll call solution two. And let's take a look. So our big question is, how long does it take to cross? How long does it take to cross the river? Okay, and therefore, um, which will be the shortest time, which direction will cause the shortest time? Good. So, what do we first need to consider? Well, I'm going to do blue. Uh, I'm going to do all the solutions in blue for, the, for situation number one. But, first of all, we need to consider that it's not just the speed of the swimmer, in fact, let me just move that a different position. Let me just put that to there. It's not just the speed of the swimmer that we need to consider, but also the speed of the river that we need to consider. And that will result in a different resultant speed, VR, and indeed an angle. Let's call it alpha, because that person will not go completely across the river which I should probably say at this stage, which I forgot to say is 30 meters across. But that person will move an angle, a certain angle, away from the perpendicular to the bank. So let's find out VR and alpha. And I think you'd be able to do this easily enough. That's a right angled triangle. And with a right angled triangle, we have simple trigonometry. So let's give it a go. I'd say V resultant squared is going to equal 1.2 squared, simple Pythagoras plus 0 0.3 squared. So therefore V resultant is going to be the square root of 1.2 squared plus 0 0.3 squared, all square rooted. And that gives me a speed of 1.24 meters per second. So they are moving faster than they were if, they were, if there was no current flowing. So this is 1.24 meters per second. What about the angle? Well, we do have the op we've got all three lengths now, so we can use any trig identity. But if I wanted to do that first, I would have had to have used the opposite and the adjacent. So those are the ones I'm going to use. So I know that tan of alpha is going to be opposite over the adjacent, which is 0 0.3 over 1.2, and therefore alpha is inverse tan. 0 0.3 over 1.2, giving me 14 degrees. Excellent. Now, let's try number two. Not as easy with number two, because we've got to um, consider a different mathematical relationship. First, let me draw... And I'm going to make a very big triangle so we can write inside it. My 1.2 meters per second speed. This is 45 degrees 
I've got 0 0.3. These are not drawn to length, but if you were to draw these, sorry, to scale, but if you were to draw them to scale, then you could just join the tips together and then measure the angle and measure the length. I'm not, never very good with um, drawing these things, so I prefer to do it algebraically. So there is the resultant, and we're looking for this angle here, let's call it phi. We're going to use a, um, a, the sine rule for this, that being, uh, sorry, the cosine rule, that being that a squared is equal to b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cosine of a, where this is a and that will be angle a, b and c. So what on earth is this angle here? This angle there. Well, I know that these two angles here, the 45 degrees and there must be 45 degrees because these are two parallel lines. And I also know that that's 90 degrees. So there gives us our quick answer. 90 plus 45 gives us 135 degrees. Wonderful. So I think I've got all the information there. I should be able to work this one out quite easily. So V is equal to the square root of V resultant uh, B squared, 0 0.3 squared, plus 1.2 squared, minus 2 by 0 0.3 by 1.2, by cosine of 135 degrees. When I put all that together, that gives me 1.41 meters per second. So considerably faster than what we're dealing with here. But what about this angle phi? Well, let me use the sine rule. So let me just put that in a little bracket there. And if I use the sine rule, that being a over sine a equals b over sine b, which equals c over sine c. And I'll put that in the brackets. So that leaves me with 1.41 divided by sine of 135 is the same as phi, oops, wait, sorry, wrong way up, which equals 0 0.3 divided by sine of phi. I'll invert all this and cross multiply. So if I bring this up to there, moving that down to there, and likewise bringing that up to there. That gives me sine of phi is 0 0.3 over 1.41 times sine of 135. And phi is going to be sine to the minus 1 of that large product. gives me 8 degrees. Okay, so 8 degrees. We've got 8 degrees in there. And I've got 101, sorry, 1.41 1. <laughs> meters per second. There. No. Okay, now, so it is going faster than the previous one, but the angle is 45 plus 8, giving us 53 degrees totally, whereas this is only going at 14 degrees. So this one's clearly got to go a lot further than this one, that number 2 is going a lot further than number 1. Is it too far for this to be faster, to have a smaller time period than this one? Well, we need to work out those um, lengths first of all. So, what we're going to do is we're going to work out what the real length there is of our 18 degree, um, 14, sorry, our 14 degree angle 
note that that's what's taking place here, 14 degrees. So what is that length? Oh. And similarly as well, what is this length here? Let's call it L2. Let's write it. That was L1. And L2, which is running at, let me just do a big angle here. This is now 45 plus 8, 53 degrees. Okay, L1. So that is, we know that we've got a triangle. I'll just draw the first triangle in so we know what's going on. L1, 30, 14 degrees. I've got my hypotenuse and an adjacent, so I know it's a cosine rule that I'm looking to adopt here. And that will give me, let me write it out in full for you, the cosine of 14 degrees is going to be the adjacent over the hypotenuse, 30 over L1. So then L1 is going to be 30 divided by cosine of 14, leaving me with, just do the maths in my head. No, I'm just joking. I've done it before. I'm just looking up the result. It's going to give me 30.9 meters. Let's try the same with L2. This time I have 53. 30 and L2. So that gives me, again, it's cosine of 53 degrees. It's 30 over L2. L2 is 30 cosine of 53, giving me 50.4 meters. Okay. So, I have my speed, and I have a distance. Similarly, I have a speed, and I have a distance. So therefore, I should be able to work out the time period of the crossing. So let's work that out. We're going to do that in a different color. So you know, this is the big sort of finale equation. So the time period for the first crossing is going to be the first distance, whoops, first distance divided by the first velocity, resultant velocity, which is 30.4 divided by my 1.24. And that gives me, uh, just look at it, sorry, 30.9, that's why, sorry, that's, sorry for the pause. And that gives me 25 seconds, whereas the time period for the second one, L2, over the resultant velocity, is going to be 50.4, much longer, and reasonably faster, but I don't think it's going to really, it's not going to beat it, no. We've got 25 seconds to go just across, let me get both pictures in now, so we've got 25 seconds to go just across, whereas it's 35 seconds to go all the way down here. So going directly across the river is the fastest process. Now you might think that this is quite a lot convoluted way of doing this. Intuitively you knew it's just straight across the river. Well let me, um, and, and you're right it is, so let me um, bring for this idea of, and I'll just bring in a new um, here, of vector components. I'd like to um, try to bring in a video as well, a video that will explain It's going to take a little bit of time to compress and put in, but it's going to explain something really interesting about how you consider motion. Now, what I've got here is uh, credit where credit is due, of course. This is um, flipping physics, 
do you find it online? If you can, there it's an excellent series of. Um, I'm just trying to straighten it out for you. There you go. It's an excellent series of videos, but this is really interesting. What they're going to do is they're going to drop a ball from a known height. At the same time, the ball rolls off the side horizontally, and I suppose you can make a little prediction now. Which one do you think is going to land first? Because what people often say in the past is the ball that's going this way will result in a parabolic path, and therefore the length of this path, L2, is greater than L1 of this ball that goes directly down. And this is L2. And so therefore, the ball speed divided by, if the same speed, you have the same speed, velocity, then T2 is going to be greater than T1. Okay, let's take a look and see what we get. That would be interesting. It's been done fast, then it's done a slightly slower, and now it's done even slower, so you can see. The impact is at exactly the same time. Now what that means is that this velocity, let's call it vertical, and this velocity horizontally do not affect one another. They are independent. And that mean, and that's because they're at 90 degrees, one does not have an effect upon the other. So that means that if you find a horizontal velocity, you can just look at the entire situation horizontally, and that will not have any, it will not change because there is a vertical component going on, just like our problem with swimming across the river. So let's now look, re-look at the problem uh, the river problem nice and quickly. We had the river, we knew it was 30 meters apart. We had 0 0.3 meters per second of the river and the person was going to go at 1.2 meters per second going across. Now in this instance here What we can say is, how long does it take to cross the river, T1? Well, that's going to be the horizontal distance, let's call it length horizontal, divided by the horizontal velocity, which is very simply 30 divided by 1.2. And 30 divided by 1.2 gives us 20 five seconds. Okay, hold on. Now if I was going this direction at 45 degrees, then what I want to know is, of my 1.2 meters per second, how much of that is in the horizontal plane? And how much of it is in the vertical plane? Because you can imagine that this, if you were to look straight down, how the length of this vector is shorter if you're just looking at its projection across. So let's try and work that out, shall we? Let's say that we know that's 45 degrees. So therefore, and I, and I do have a hypotenuse, and I want to know the adjacent, so we're back to a cosine relationship. So cosine of 45 equals the op adjacent over the hypotenuse. So therefore, V horizontal will give me 1.2 cosine of 45 degrees, which is, let's get this right, cosine of 45 0 0.85 meters per second. 
So therefore this time period 2 is going to be the length horizontally divided by the horizontal velocity, which is 30 over 0 0.85, which gives us 35.3 seconds. And if you remember from our previous uh, slide, 25 seconds and 35.3 seconds was the time it took in those two instances to get across the river. So the whole thing ties in together neatly. So let's just um, let's explain that just a little bit further. Let's say that we want to swim directly across and arrive at the other side of the bank the other side of the bank so you know you're going to have to set off upstream but what angle theta do you need to set up at upstream in order to make sure you get to the other side of the bank? Well, what I'd suggest is, if you're going upstream at an angle theta, and you know you're swimming at 1.2 meters per second, then that will project a certain vertical speed and a horizontal speed. If the V vertical equals the V of the stream, then vertically the velocity equals zero, if that makes sense, because we've got the stream going this way at 0 0.3 meters per second, and the projection vertically of this vector is 0 0.3 meters per second, then you're just going to drift completely horizontally across the river. So what we need to do is say that we're looking for the opposite, we know what value we want it to be, and we've got the horizontal, oh, sorry the hypotenuse, so what's the angle? Sine theta equals opposite over hypotenuse. So therefore sine theta is going to equal 0 0.3 over 1.2. So then theta is inverse sine 0 0.3 over 1.2, which gives us, let's see what we've got. So <clears throat> Fourteen point five degrees, and if you remember from the previous video, that's the speed, that's the angle at which the person would set off at if they were going directly across the river. The resultant angle they'd set off at. Okay, excellent. So, in all cases, well, let's just talk about actually. In most cases you will have probably a resultant speed, force, a resultant of sorts, and this could be velocities, forces, what have you. And the resultant, you'll have lovely right angle triangles in most instances, and you'll have angles, and you'll have the horizontal R vertical, and the R vertical is going to be R sine of theta, and the horizontal is R cosine of theta. And we're going to use those extensively in the next few examples of forces. Now how do we make use of vectors, sorry, um, components of forces um, to solve problems? Well, let me give you a few uh, very usual setups which you need to be able to um, understand. The first one is inclined planes and it's often going to be an object or a car sitting 
on an inclined plane. There is the object itself, and you can imagine that there's going to be weight acting, but because we've got an angle and this is inclined, then the weight of this is acting directly down in accordance with the direction of the gravitational field strength. But that means that there will be a component acting down the slope, which means that it will encourage this block to start to slip. Now, what's the size of that force? Well, let's find an equivalent angle to the one that we have here, theta. Well, if we um, gather the the parallel planes, we know that this angle is theta there. So parallel, parallel, theta, theta. We also know that the entirety of this angle is 90 degrees, so therefore this is going to be 90 minus theta. So that's 90 minus theta. So therefore, similarly, this one here will be 90 minus theta, and that leaves us with this one being theta, because we know that the entire angle there is 90 degrees, so we have theta. Now that's the one that we're interested in. So if I take that out in red, this is the triangle that we're interested in. Where this side is W, there is the force down the plane, and this is the reaction force. Okay, so let me just draw that in again. That is going to equal the force, the reaction on the plane. And this is going to be the force down the plane. And there is theta. Okay, so let's imagine an example. For instance, let's say we have five degrees and we have the, um, the angle and we have a car that's of a weight of, let's say, 7,000 newtons, a bit of a light car, but nonetheless, there's some thickness. Now, the force down the slope, this one, is the same as that one. So therefore, we can simply say that the force, if we're trying to look for the force down the slope, that's going to be equal to, well, in the triangles, of course, we have our opposite, is F over the hypotenuse that we know is sine of theta. So F over W is equal to sine of theta. And so therefore F is going to be W sine theta in this instance, 7,000 sine 5 degrees, which gives us 610 newtons. Of course, you know that that makes sense that this is theta, because if this were to drop down and be parallel, and this would be no degrees, then of course the weight would be acting vertically and there'd be no degrees between these two. Good, you might often be asked, um, at what point does this angle have to increase before this starts to slip if friction offered you an, an opposing force in the other direction? Um, but essentially that is an inclined plane problem. You um, let's do one more to see if you can get see how you get on. There's an example. Let's look for. We've got a rough plank. It's resting at thirty five degrees. There is a weight of one thousand three hundred newtons of this block. And. We know that it's static, it's stationary, and I want you to work out for me the reaction and the size of the frictional force that's exerted. Okay, if you think you know the answer, hit pause, otherwise here comes the solution. Right, let's just draw in my triangle. There's theta, which is 35. It's the force down the slope, that's the reaction, that's the frictional force. So, with my triangle, my right angle triangle, I've got 35 degrees, I've got 1300 zero, zero newtons, there's R, and there's the frictional force. So R is going to be, well, I've got my hypotenuse, 
divided by the adjacent over the hypotenuse equals cosine of. So therefore it's going to be 1300 cosine of 35 degrees, which gives me 1065 newtons. What about the frictional force? Well, that's going to be the opposite. So it's going to be sine. So opposite over hypotenuse equals sine of 35. So it's 0, 0, sine of 35, which gives us 746 newtons. Wonderful. Now, the other example that we're going to look at is if we have um, an object suspended at an angle. So we'll call this one, um, let's call it, uh, yeah, suspended masses or suspended mass. And here we have an object that has a mass and there's a force acting on it and that means that it holds itself away from the vertical by an angle of uh, theta to the upright. Now, this is quite interesting actually, this one, because that is going to create a tension in the string. And we know that we have a triangle here, which is um, right angled. And so therefore we have an expression for the vertical, T vertical and T horizontal. And we can then resolve any of these if given um, the data that we're given. So let's give you some data to this one. Let's say the bob weighs five newtons. So mg is five newtons. And let's say f is one newton that's pulling it to one side. So therefore, I suppose what's the tension in the string? and the angle it makes with the vertical. Well, we can make a choice of either of these um, situations. We can either resolve T vertically or T horizontally. Let's go T horizontally first. I know that because I've got an angle of theta here, then I'm looking for the opposite of the T horizontal. So opposite over the hypotenuse is sine theta. So therefore, opposite over the hypotenuse is sine of theta. And I'll just get that arranged a little bit better. And so therefore, t horizontal is t sine of theta. Now, because it's in equilibrium, we also know that that must be 1 newton. Good. But still, two unknowns here. Let's resolve it vertically and see what happens. So T vertical. So now I've got the adjacent over the hypotenuse is cosine of theta. So therefore T vertical is T cosine of theta. And I know that's equal to 5 newtons. So in this instance, let's just do some rearranging. T is 1 over sine theta. So if we substitute this into there, I get 1 over sine theta cos theta is 5, which gives me 1 divided by tan of theta. Hopefully you know that sine theta over cos theta is tan theta. It's the inverse of it equals 5. So then theta is tan to the minus 1 of a fifth, because I've just inverted that upside down, which gives me an answer of 11.3 degrees. Okay, working back, what's TV? Well, that's going to be, what, sorry, what's T? Sorry, not TV. Well, we could either, we can go around this along, we can either substitute back into either of these equations, or we can know that the, we've got a, um, a right angle triangle, and then this is going to be the um, hypotenuse of these two values that we've worked out. So, but anyway, let's just, um, let's see what we've got. So I know that. Let's go for that method then. Because I've got 1 newton and 5 newtons, this 
value for t is going to be 1 squared plus 5 squared square rooted, which gives me 5.1 newtons. Wonderful. There's the second example of how you're going to make use of this um, of these forces. So another example, but it's worthy to start a whole new um, slide on this, is moments and looking at how moments and components of forces um, come to affect moments. Um, a few things that we need to talk about briefly first, and that is um, what is a moment? Well, a moment is a force times a perpendicular distance from the pivot. Now you might think to yourself, well, that's, that's obvious enough, but there are some interesting um, issues that throws up. I mean, first of all, let's just look at an example. Here's a moment. Let's say I've got 18 newtons, and I've got that sitting at five meters. Then here's my pivot, and so therefore the moment is going to be doing by five times 18, which gives us very simply 90 Newton meters in an anti-clockwise direction. That's important to note because it's maybe anti-clockwise. But how do we resolve a problem like this where you would have a force acting at an angle? Let's say 15 newtons is acting at an angle of 40 degrees. So now what is the moment that takes place? Well, there's two ways to do this. Let's do the first way. We would want to know <coughs> what the vertical component of the force is. And of course, sorry, I should have said, I'm assuming this is five meters again. So if we work out the force, the vertical component of the force, let me draw this all in red so we know what's going on here. We can say that the moment is equal to the force times the distance, the perpendicular distance, which is the same as FV by 5 meters. Now what is FV? Well, the, that's the same as this, that vector. So the opposite over the hypotenuse gives a sine theta. So FV over 15 equals sine of 40 degrees. So therefore, the moment is going to be 15 sine 40 by 5 meters. I've just rearranged that and brought that up to there. And that gives us 15 sine 40 by 5, which is 48.2 newton meters. Keep checking at all stages where you think that sounds right. I mean, it, it's, a, it's about right. five lots of, if this were perpendicular, we'd be at 50, 75. So that, at that angle gives us 48, looks about right. But interestingly, what we could do instead is we could say, okay, well, that's the pivot. Well, what's the perpendicular distance to that force? So the second way of dealing with it would be the moment is the force, all 15, by the perpendicular distance, which gives us 15 by the perpendicular distance. So different to how we did the first one. So, how are we going to go about that? Well, I've got, if this is my vector diagram, what I'm, if this is my diagram here, let me just get the highlight in, five meters, what I'm looking for is this 
the opposite and that's the hypotenuse so the opposite over the hypotenuse is sine 40 in terms of distances so therefore this is going to equal 15 by let's call this perpendicular distance well let's just find the perpendicular distance which is opposite perpendicular distance divided by 5 equals sine of 40. Therefore, 15 by 5 sine 40 gives us 48.2 newton meters. If you see what we've done here, this is nearly, it is identical, those two equations, other than what, the only difference is, is that we've multiplied the 5 by the sine of 40 rather than the 15 by the sine of 40 but because they're all products they're getting to the same end point anyway so that's worth noting a method by which we deal with moments where forces are acting on angles on objects now of course the other bit worth noting is the principle of um, the principle of moments, which talks about, very simply, the principle of moments. Which states that the, um, the system is an equilibrium if the anti-clockwise moments is equal to the clockwise moment. I don't think we need to do lots of practice on that because I think that will come into effect when I talk about the next bit. But needless to say, if you did have a beam and you had more than one weight on one side, you have to find the moment of each of these, respectively. M1, M2, add them together, and that will equal the same as M3, we're hoping. Good. Well, let's move on because we'll get to use that in a moment. Uh, bridges problem. Now, with a bridges problem, <clears throat> you do not have one focal point. In effect, you could have, you have two of them. Um, sorry, pivots. Sorry, what am I talking about? Pivots. Here is a bridge. Badly drawn bridge, but bridge nonetheless. And we are told that there's a, the bridge has a weight. It has a distance of, <clears throat> let's say, 16 meters. And you have some people positioned on it as well. People of 920 newtons sitting at 5.2 meters and another person at 3.5 meters, 760 newtons, and the weight of the bridge itself is 6,000 newtons. And what it asks is, what is the force that each of these uprights exerts in order to support the weight of that bridge? Well, the way in which you go about this type of problem is you take one of those points as a fulcrum, as a pivot, and then you resolve the forces about that point. So what we would do here is we'd say, OK, what's the anti-clockwise moments going on? No, let's say the clockwise moments. So the clockwise moments, and that should equal the anti-clockwise moments. <clears throat> so what's the first clockwise moment? Well, we have... 760 by 3.5. Add that to 
And interestingly, we've got the weight of the bridge. We've got 16 metres. Now, the weight of the bridge, if it's a uniform bridge, which I should have said it was, acts in the middle. And, the, in other words, the centre of gravity. So we have all 6,000 newtons acting at 8 metres. Add to that as well, this um, 16 minus 5.2 distance by 920, and that is my entire clockwise moment. My anti-clockwise moment, of course, is simply the full length of the bridge multiplied by F2. So... If I work that out, F2 gives me 3787 newtons. Okay. So we could, if we wanted to, do the reverse and go, okay, let's work around the other point. It's not an identical um, equation, in actual fact, because... If we're going to look at the clockwise moments and the anti-clockwise moments again and work out whether they're equal, we would have to work in the other direction and say, OK, anti-clockwise is going to be 5.2 by 920 plus 6,000 by 8 metres. So this is different straight away, but we've got the same. And then we've got... Um, 16 minus 3.5 by 720, and that equals, in terms of clockwise, 60 metres by F1. So F1 will equal. Now, I'm not going to go through that long equation at the moment because there is a quicker way of doing this, and that's to say that the total weight acting on the bridge must equal to the total forces acting upright to support the weight. So if the total weights are 760 plus the weight of the bridge, 6,000, plus the other person acting on it, 920, that must equal, I already know I've got F2 equaling that, plus F1. F1 must equal 3893 newtons. And when you do do the sums, you notice that they actually come out to be identical. So you can do it both ways. So the technique is take a support as the pivot, as a pivot, and equate the moments about this point. And then you can reverse the process if you need to. <coughs> okay, it can get much more complicated. Let me show you one more complicated one, or indeed I'll let you give this a go and see if you can uh, solve it yourself. Two supports with a bar, a non-uniform bar in actual fact. Let's call it T1, T2. And the weight of the bar is acting one meter off the center line. And we've also got 240 newtons acting at half a meter. And the total distance is three meters. We also know that T2 is a hundred newtons. So what is the weight of the bar? And what is T? So if you think you can do that, that's great. And the next bit is what is T1 equal to? Okay. If you think you know, hit pause and give it a go. Otherwise, here comes the solution.
Right, let's take our fulcrum this end, because I know what that one is. And let's say that I have. We're going to work with uh, clockwise is anti-clockwise. That's probably easier to work out. So my clockwise moments are, I've got 0 0.5 by 240 plus 3 minus 1 by the weight of the bar. And that equals 3 lots by 100, which is the tension in the string on the other side. It's going to be minus. So 2w is 300 minus 120. So therefore, w is equal to 180 over 2, which is 90 newtons. T1, of course, is going to equal what well, both T1 plus T2 must equal 90 newtons. And we already know that T1 is 100. So therefore, oops, of course it's 90 plus the 240. There we go. So therefore, if T1 is already 100, T, that's 90 plus 240 minus the 100. And that gives us 130, 130 newtons. Sorry, that should be 230 newtons. So there are your two solutions. Okay, now it just you can imagine how that we get more and more complicated these setups. But essentially, if you just keep resolving things vertically, horizontally, and then placing them into clockwise and anti-clockwise moments, then you should be a okay. There's one other type of problem that's worth mentioning here, and that is the problem of toppling. Toppling over. Now, when you have a, an object, we need to confidently talk about the center of gravity, or indeed, the center of mass. Or the center of mass. And how do we define that point? Well, we define it as a point in which the entire weight of the object acts from. So from that point you can consider W. If that object were to start to move and to lean over, then when does it topple? Well, toppling occurs when the line of action, line of action, which is in effect this thing here, that's the line of action. Moves beyond the pivot, the object will topple. So you can imagine actually simple situations whereby you're going to be offered um, the dimensions of an object, let's say the height and the width, and you're going to work out at the point of toppling what type of angle you have. If that were drawn a little bit better, then that would be the case. So let's just imagine what that would be, therefore. There we go. 
point of topple. And we have a height and a width. Well, what we want to do is work out the angle theta. So we want to work out, this is w over 2, and that's h over 2. So therefore, tan of theta will equal the opposite over the adjacent, which is w over 2 over h over 2, which is w over h, because the 2's cancel out. So theta is going to be tan to the minus 1 of w over h. That's going to be the simple method of working out the angle of topple. So let's give it an example then. We have a block that is oops, not well drawn 60 centimetres high 40 wide and it's on a plane and the question's asking at what angle will it top at? So if you think the answer you know the answer hit pause otherwise here comes the solution. Well there is theta compared to that, remember the inclined plane the problem. And we know that this will topple at that point there in which we have a triangle such as that. With the opposite being 40 over 2 and the adjacent being 60 over 2. So therefore the angle, or tan of the angle, is the opposite over the adjacent, which gives us Let's get rid of the tens as well. 4 over 6. So theta is going to be 10 to the minus 1 of 2 thirds. Oops, the minus is not really working So 10 to the minus 1 of 2 thirds is 33.7 degrees. I would go into much more depth, but we don't really need to. These are all it will be is just constant examples of how this takes place. So I hope that's made sense.